This is Friday, October 2nd, 2015. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Julian Busgang. Welcome, Julian. Hello. Welcome. May I ask when you were born? I was born in March 1925. And where were you born? I was born in a city called Lwów, Poland, which was the third largest city of Poland, located in southeastern part of Poland. And I understand that is now part of the Ukraine? It is now called Lviv in Ukraine. What community do you currently live in? I currently live in a retirement community called Newbridge on the Charles. And what town is that in? That's in Dedham, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I am married for... 55 years. Congratulations. Do you have children? We have three children. Grandchildren? And we have eight grandchildren. Great grandchildren? None yet. <laughs> Tell us what it was like growing up in Poland. Well, we were. Um, um, in a rather well-to-do family in Lviv, uh, assimilated Jewish family, which belonged to the progressive Jewish uh, synagogue. There were a few of them in Poland, in big cities. What did your parents do for a living? My father was a representative for uh, several major foreign companies and um, distributed uh, um, goods, uh, mostly um, things like margarine and, uh, and starch and uh, uh, two stores. Mm -hmm. Did you have siblings? I had one sister. And what did your mother do for a living? My mother um, helped my father. Uh, um, she, my father's office was in the same house. We lived in a three-story house, and ground floor was my father's office. Second floor was our apartment. And the third floor was some of the people who served us and some and one tenant. And uh, my mother would spend some of her time in my father's office helping with the books. Did but you... when we needed her, she would come upstairs mm -hmm. and attend to us. But we had people... Um, we had a cook and we had a maid who um, served us. Did you or your family experience any discrimination before the rise of the Nazis? We did experience influence of the National Democratic Party in Poland, which was abbreviated as ND or Endetia or Endex, and they, many of them were university students and they would um, sometimes um, beat uh, Jewish children on the street, but, um, but it was not completely per pervasive. It was just last few years after Hitler came to power, there was influence in Poland. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we had uh, 
Polish Christian friends as well. Tell us about the German invasion of Poland in September 1939. German invasion of Poland took place on the 1st of September 1939 and it was um, based on the notion that Germany wanted to connect East Germany, which was part of Germany on the, on the Baltic um, and separated by a corridor from the mainland Germany and uh, there was a free city called Danzig or Gdańsk in Polish. And, um, but basically the Germans started moving forward with tanks and, um, and Polish army um, didn't have tanks and um, started retreating. But it fought bravely and a lot of it was cavalry, but it didn't work against the tanks. And when did the Nazis hit your area? Well, our area was in eastern Poland. The Nazis uh, started moving forward about the 5th of September or so. My parents, who had experienced World War I, decided that it might be a good idea to leave um, to avoid um, the Nazi invasion. And, um, and um, at first we thought that it would be just my father and I who will escape. But, and the cars were being confiscated by the army, but my aunt and uncle had a lot of influence and they were allowed to keep their car temporarily and they agreed to take us and travel south um, towards the Romanian border. We actually had a tenant who was a friend of my father's who was a German, an Austrian, and he advised uh, my family to leave as soon as possible, and because he knew was it, what would be happening with the Nazis. So the Nazis had a secret agreement with Soviet Union, and we escaped south, but the Germans never entered our city um, because the Soviets had a secret agreement with uh, Germany and they entered uh, our city on the 17th of September. And we were already gone when we were close to the border and we saw the Polish government evacuate. We heard a loudspeaker call out Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and cars from Warsaw <laughs> would cross the Romanian border. So my pa father said they must know what they're doing, we will follow. And um, the car was to be returned to the Polish army, so our driver, my pa father and my uncle couldn't drive, even though they both had cars. So the chauffeur who drove us was promised that he could go back to his family and return the car to the Polish military. Uh, who confiscated it, but um, we never saw him again, and we never saw the car, and uh, my parents uh, um, 
bribed a border guard at night, uh, the Romanian border guard, and we crossed to Romania. You and mentioned at the beginning of the interview your family was fairly well-to-do. Do you remember what you took with you to Romania? Well, my father had a few bars of gold and and he was able to um, carry them, take, took them out of the bank and carry them with us. So when we got to Romania, we had a few bars of gold and my mother had her jewelry. What about you? I didn't have very much. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, we actually um, um, had very little room in my aunt's car. She had to leave some fur coats to accommodate us. And um, Uh, she wasn't too happy about that? Well, well, she was my mother's older mm -hmm. sister and looked after her a little bit. What, uh, did you like bring clothes, maybe a toy? or? We brought one suitcase uh, that we could carry. Now you're over in Romania. Do you remember what part of Romania your family settled in? Well, we first went to the city called Czerniowce in Polish, in Czernitz, I think, in Romania. And then a Jewish family um, let us sleep there overnight because we met somebody uh, who recommended that person. And then we took the train to Bucharest, and in Bucharest we took one room in the cheapest hotel we could find, and and uh, my parents, my sister and I all slept in this one room, and um, and my parents were running from consulate to consulate to see what other visas they can get to get out of Romania. And because my father had these bars of gold, he qualified for a capitalist visa to Palestine. Palestine was British mandated territory and it was not taking any more Jewish immigrants, but capitalist visas were allowed, so we got a capitalist visa. But before we got that visa, I attended French, first a French school. My parents enlisted me in a French school. And then a Polish school was formed with children of refugees, and I transferred to the Polish school. How long did you live in Romania? I was in Romania about um, eight months, I think. And while you were you while you you and your family were living there, uh, did were you treated well by the native Romanians? We were treated well, but Romania was falling under German influence and King Karol resigned and was succeeded by his son, but the sort of German influence was beginning to be felt, so we were very eager to depart. And how did you get from Romania to Tel Aviv? We... Um, took a ship from um, Constanza, which is a harbor on the Black Sea um, in Romania, and went through the, um, and went um, through Istanbul and Athens uh, to Haifa, and I still remember 
being able to visit Istanbul one day and uh, Athens one day, which influenced me very much, seeing oh, beautiful buildings there. And then we got to Haifa and we uh, again took the smallest apartment uh, room we could find and um, and shortly afterwards the British government evacuated other Polish refugees to Palestine because of German influence. So the Polish school from Bucharest was moved to Tel Aviv and it started functioning in a building that was owned by the Polish bank PKO, Polish um, abbreviated, and that bank had a building in Tel Aviv, so we started taking classes there. And my favorite mathematics teacher, because I like mathematics, was a former prime minister of Poland who uh, was teaching mathematics and uh, there were other Polish dignitaries who were trying to help children. While you were in Tel Aviv, can you describe a little more about life at that time? Uh, for example, did you guys get enough to eat? Was there socialization? Um, we had very little money at that point and we my mother became a seamstress and uh, was sewing dresses and teaching other ladies to sew and that's how we supported ourselves and my father tried to get money from his previous uh, uh, foreign uh, business partners uh, who owed him a little bit here and there. While you were in Tel Aviv, what was the best way you got news about what was happening elsewhere? Um, we had uh, a radio and that was our best news. There was no television in those days. <laughs> Uh, did you ever get to go to a movie theater? Yes, we actually had a um, comfortable life uh, in Tel Aviv and uh, the Polish community had a lot of um, people who were friendly with each other and um, and uh, and most of the people were former government officials or wives of former government officials or former military <laughs> officers. And we were all good friends. And uh, when you were in school, you were mentioning your math teacher being a former Polish minister. Uh, were you being kept also aware of what was happening, especially after, say, America entered the war? Well, we had reports from Poland and we knew what was happening to Jews under German occupation and um, and then um, and some people actually were sending money to their relatives in Poland um, but in those days people used telegrams uh, there was no internet, <laughs> so people sent messages by telegram. Did you ever hear accounts of the Warsaw Ghetto? We did hear accounts, yes. And concentration camps? Yes, and, and in June 1941, Germany unexpectedly invaded Soviet Union and um, and um, 
and our city, my home city Lvov, was invaded uh, by the Germans. And there a ghetto was formed. And um, it was very hard to get accounts afterwards. Did you graduate from this Polish high school in Tel Aviv? I graduated from Polish high school in Tel Aviv in um, um, 1942. I was, um, I started school young and I never lost any year of school. Mm -hmm even during the war. And um, at that time, um, Soviet Union agreed to release Polish prisoners who had been deported to Siberia and Kamchatka and other places. And, um, and we started getting refugees from Soviet Union and then the Polish army was formed in the Soviet Union and allowed to leave um, Soviet Union to go to the Middle East to help the British army fight uh, Rommel in Africa. and. Um, And um, most of us who graduated, almost all of us, joined the Polish army. I had a choice of joining the British Brigade, Jewish Brigade, or or going um, or going into the Jewish underground to fight the British, but I felt it was more important to fight the Nazis. So mm -hmm. I joined the Polish army, and um, our commander was General Wladyslaw Anders, who was Polish, and he had been imprisoned, but he was freed um, to allow the army to lead the Polish army and um, he started as a Protestant because his family had German roots but he then converted to Roman Catholic. You've just graduated, you have joined the Polish army in Tel Aviv, the Middle East and I know this is, um, did you have basic training? I had basic training in the desert near the Suez Canal. My first assignment was in light tanks called Valentines, which were Swedish made tanks. And um and um, um after the training I was um allowed um, to enter officer school and, um, and because I was good at mathematics I was assigned to artillery school because artillery requires a lot of mathematics and um, the Polish artillery officer school was in Gedera which is was in Palestine and um, Many of the soldiers were from having been in prison in Soviet Union, and a few were my colleagues from Polish high school. And then um, in the Polish officer school, when you graduate, when you graduate, only top two or three or five of the class become officers. The others are called cadet officers and they're allowed to use um, officers club but they're not officers. 
but in emergency they're promoted to officers. So um, I was assigned to the 5th Division, the 5th Light Anti-Aircraft Artillery, and we had Bofors guns, 40 millimeter Bofors guns, and we were shipped from through Alexandria in Egypt to Italy, and we uh, Italian, uh, the British Eighth Army had already uh, just invaded Italy and we first went to Toronto and then we made our way along the Adriatic coast up north um, fighting slowly up and um, and then we were shipped on British um, ships and we actually manned the anti-aircraft artillery on the ships while we were being shipped. And then um, the Polish army was uh, asked to move east, uh, move west and we um, uh, Polish army was assigned to attack at Monte Cassino, mm -hmm. which had been um, uh, had undergone three other attacks, which did not succeed. Okay, we're going to pause just a quick uh, work moment here. Uh, you're in the Polish army. You're under British command. Uh, did the British officers and personnel treat you guys okay? Uh, we don't didn't see many British officers mm -hmm. at my level, except in training. And the timeline for you approaching Italy up to Monte Cassino, we're not talking about 1943, 44? Yes. Tell, okay, now give us a little background. 44, most. Okay. Uh, the... American troops landed in mm -hmm. Anzio okay. under General Clark and were surrounded by the Germans, not allowed to move forward. But after Polish troops took Monte Cassino, um, the American army was able to break through and mm -hmm. march into Rome. Let's dwell a little more on Monte Cassino because this was such an essential part of the Italian campaign. Uh, my understanding was it was kind of high up there. Well, Monte Cassino, um, the town is called Cassino. Monte mm -hmm. Cassino is a, a mountain with a monastery at the top and it started with a tremendous um, air uh, attack uh, so that um, the monastery was partly in ruins and a lot of other places were uh, bombed and there were no leaves or branches on the okay. trees. There was so much bombardment okay, and, just, and okay. we could not take the guns up the mountain because the slopes were too steep, so we became infantry. So I became infantry at uh, Monte Cassino. And, just and we were climbing and mm -hmm. we had to watch for mines and mm -hmm. there were, um, and we were just uh, going by foot, step by step. And, and this is because the Germans were up there. Right and they could mm -hmm. see what was mm -hmm. happening down the mountain. And the sign on the road was, uh, move fast, you're under artillery fire. <laughs> How long did it take you and your units to get up Monte Cassino? Um, 
Well, it started, it took like maybe three weeks. Um, it started uh, in May or so. And um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had, uh, I think, just taken place. And, um, and the Germans were in uh, holes in the ground uh, uh, protected by sandbags and, mm -hmm. and it was a very tough climb mm -hmm. up the mountain. You mentioned that you pretty much became infantry. Can you describe some of the equipment that you had with you? Yes, we had light um, machine guns and um, and, um, and we had to carry ammunition up the mountain and um, and, um, and we had rifles and we had grenades. And remember what kind of rifles you were carrying? They were British rifles, I don't remember. They make. And this was this like the first time you were seeing real action, like dead bodies and stuff no, like that? No, we saw real action on the Adriatic. And during all this time, uh, this is still your unit of the Polish Army, did you still have uh, friends in, within the unit? Yes, I had friends within the unit. Uh, mm -hmm. We, as a cadet officer, I was more friendly with other cadet officers than with soldiers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have and uh, all my colleagues had been in Siberia, so, and uh, I was one of the youngest because um, the others had already been in prison for a while. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any particular uh, incident or event that while you were up there trying to get up Monte Cassino? Well. I remember uh, colleagues being uh, blown up by mines and by guns and the wounded being carried out and there were no vans to take them out, they had to be carried and there were a lot of casualties. Um, a Polish cemetery is now at the foot of the mountain and there are, the casualties were like a thousand soldiers, which was very many for mm -hmm. the number of troops we had. And while you were fighting your way up Monte Cassino, did you have at least a chance to eat or sleep? We ate um, mostly from cans. cans. <laughs> of soup or cans of uh, we 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 had very little to eat and sleep and we were given by the British a pack of cigarettes a day which I had never smoked before but I was so hungry that I started smoking it was uh, like uh, small packs, and it uh, was part of our ration. Three weeks, and did you finally make it to the top of Monte Cassino? We did, and a Polish flag was mounted at the top of the monastery, and, the, and General Andres asked that a British flag be put up as well. And um, and the monastery was in ruins. 
it has now been rebuilt and at the basement of the current monastery is a museum of the battle and it shows Polish army photographs. And what happened to the Germans who were on top of Monte Cassino? We were taking German prisoners instead of being big warlords. They were now uh, prisoners. Do you remember uh, encountering any of these? I did. I did find, uh, for example, a letter that a German soldier had written to his family, but didn't mail, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it it seemed like a family-like letter. <laughs> but um, we had encountered Germans uh, on the along the Adriatic when we fought the first time around, and um, and um, and. Um, and they were very bad to the Italians, and um, as you know, Mussolini escaped north and then was hung. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's post Monte Cassino. Tell us what happened after. After Monte Cassino, we were moved back to the Adriatic. And we fought at um, Ancona, and um, and then our last battle was in Bologna. And there was a theory that the British did not want us to move too fast forward because they wanted the German army extended in Italy to help the invasion of Britain, of Germany from England. So they wanted German troops to be tied up partially in it. Mm -hmm. How long were you and your unit in Italy overall? Um, we were in Italy. Well, the Battle of Monte Cassino was mm -hmm. in May of 1944. The war ended in 45, mm -hmm. but we were in Italy like a year. I would say. And what did you, what was your reaction when you found out Germany had capitulated? Oh, we were all delighted. <laughs> and I was, because I spoke English and German, I was assigned to the British to. Um, help uh, sorting out prisoners and um, and question the German soldiers because um, prisoners from various who had been kept by the Germans were liberated and the British were sorting them out and sending them to different countries you know like they would have a train to go to Yugoslavia, they would have a train to go to France, mm -hmm. and um, and there were, and these prisoners from the camps was a terrible scene to mm -hmm. see. Can you tell us a little more about that? Um, Some of them didn't want to go back, you know, like some of them didn't want to go back to Soviet Union, some of them didn't want to go back to Yugoslavia. Um, um, it was a very sad scene to, to see that. And how about your, yourself? The war ends. Well, when the war ended, our general said that Polish intelligentsia has been killed, so he decided to send us who 
had finished uh, high school to Italian universities. So I was sent to um, Turin, Torino, Italy. I want to study engineering. Some other people want to study medicine. They might have gone to a different city. And we had a Polish military dormitory in Torino. And that's where I started my education, uh, academic. Tell us a little bit more about uh, Torino at war's end. Uh, was it damaged in any way? Torino was not damaged very mm -hmm. much. And um, Fiat was the big factory in the mm -hmm. area. And um, and um, they were, they started playing soccer like before the war. <laughs> and how about your family? My family was still in Palestine, but in Torino we were given, when the war ended, um, we were given choice of going back to Poland, which was under communist control at that point, or going to England. So most of us went to England because uh, they had, most of my colleagues had been in Siberia and didn't want to go back under communist control. Only those who had left families and uh, children would go back and some of them would be imprisoned after they got there. But uh, we went to England and we were uh, transferred to something called Polish Resettlement Corps, which was no longer Polish Army but British Army. And um, and in those days there was mandatory labor in England, so uh, some of the soldiers would be sent to work in mines in England. And the younger ones who were ready for education, were given equivalent of GI Bill, so I was sent to London and mm -hmm. I could study again uh, and um, uh, I became an external student of the University of London. The University of London had internal students and external students because some of the external students were in India or in Canada, and um, but we had external students in London, and we had something called Polish University College. So we studied in Polish University College for University of London exams, and um, and we had a very small stipend, so I shared the room with another fellow from the army. Tell us a little more about life in post-war London. <laughs> well, uh, London was partly, it had quite a bit of destruction, but uh, some areas were not uh, destroyed, but some areas had been bombed. And um, we were some I happen to know English because I had lived in Palestine and I learned English but um, but others my colleagues didn't know English so that was they had to study English and um, and um, I was studying very hard to catch up with time I lost and I uh, applied for an American visa. And I was uh, also going to ask uh, whether you and your family had also had to deal with rationing. Um, we did mm -hmm. and my family to answer your question the British when the 
war started for independence of Israel, the Polish refugees were evacuated from Palestine to England, so I reconnected with my family. And when did you graduate? <laughs> well, I had applied for an American visa okay. when I was still in Italy studying in Torino. And I went for an interview with the American consul in Genoa. I had a friend who suggested I apply to uh, University of Southern California and I was admitted. So I went for the student visa and the consul asked me, do you want to stay in America? I said, of course. And he said, I can't give you a student visa. <laughs> you have to apply for an immigration visa and you'll wait five years. And I waited five years. I was in England when the visa came. And when the visa came, it was going to expire in March of 1949. My final exam was going to be in June of 49. I said, can you, went to the consul, said, can you extend the visa? He says, I can't extend the visa. You have to wait five years more. So I went to the university and asked them whether I could go to Canada to take the final exam, or do I have to come back to England uh, rather than uh, not uh, lose all my undergraduate studies. And the uh, University of London agreed to send the final exam to New York. So I arrived in New York in March and in June took final exam at Columbia, supervised by College Entrance Examination Board. And uh, there were two or three other people taking exam with me who were children of British uh, um, diplomatic people. Okay. You have finally landed in this country. That's right. What was your first impression of the United States? Well, when I arrived in the United States, the um, Korean War was there was uh, economic uh, crisis so I couldn't get a job I mm -hmm. applied to do deliveries for a pharmacy and they said you're too well educated you will not stay with us and um, and I and I didn't have my bachelor's degree yet because the exam papers went to London by boat and uh, I couldn't get a job and then I got a notice to register for the military service to go to Korea but they excused me because I had been a veteran already and they recognized Polish veterans. Uh, uh, who were allies, and um, and I got admitted to MIT. So I uh, had been advised by a friend to apply from England to, when I already knew I was going to go to America. So I came to Boston, and I became a student, uh, and I worked in the cafeteria that gave me meals and I was also a technician in a lab and I was a student part-time. So then, so I liked America. Okay, so uh, when did you graduate from MIT? I received my master's degree from yes. MIT in 1950, 1951, yeah. I came to America in 49, I received 
master's degree in 51. And was his family still in England? My family was already in New York. They oh. came actually before mm -hmm. I did because I stayed as long as possible to study in London. And once your family was in New York, did your parents uh, uh, work for a living? Yeah, my mother continued sewing and my father delivered newspapers, uh, mm -hmm. uh, photographs, mm -hmm. and also worked in a kiosk selling newspapers, different time, different thing. He didn't speak English very, very much. And my about, mother spoke mm -hmm. English a little bit. And how about your sister? My sister went from Palestine to Beirut, Lebanon to study at the French University and she um, came to America together with my parents. She left uh, when the British were evacuating. I hope they didn't have as much red tape as you did. <laughs> no, they did not. Oh, good. You now have your master's degree from MIT. Tell us what happened next. What happened next, I started working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Um, I got a clearance because I had been an Allied soldier and was certainly anti-Soviet and and then I um, um, started studying part-time at Harvard and I be, got uh, ended up going full-time and got a PhD at Harvard and I was consultant to Lincoln Laboratory which mm -hmm. was helping me finance my education. So I got a PhD at Harvard and a master's degree from MIT <laughs> Not without <bad>. any money. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do for a living? And then I um, went to work for RCA in Waltham, Massachusetts, which was a new division of RCA. And then I left RCA to start my own company mm -hmm. and work mostly on government contracts. During all this time, your native land is under Soviet control and would be for quite a long time. Were you able ever to uh, contact family, friends who are still out there? Well, I was afraid to be in contact because I had a clearance mm -hmm. and I was working on military technology. But um, after I retired, I, I did um, actually locate a couple cousins who survived the war, two ladies who... Um, um, one survived pretending uh, not to be Jewish, and the other one survived uh, in forests and in holes. So we dis decided to go and visit Poland and, and connect it with the cousins who are no longer alive. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you get to visit Poland? It was, I retired in 1980. Seven, and I um, and we went to visit Poland in 1989. I think. So right when communism fell, around right, that time. Right, it was just about yeah. Mm -hmm. Solidarity was just uh, uh, establishing itself, and mm -hmm. it was uh, communist was about to fall. Yeah. Did you get to visit your your old haunts? Well, yes. no, to go to Ukraine. Um, we went to Ukraine, actually. We got a visa to Ukraine, and it was still under Soviet control, but it was... Um, uh, but the Ukrainians were looking for independence. Mm -hmm. 
and I we did get to visit my old house and uh, my old mm -hmm. school and and I showed my children. Okay. So Julian, before we wrap up this interview, I wanted to um, have you take that helmet and kind of show us what that was. Is is well, this is a British helmet. Uh huh with a Polish eagle to symbolize that we were the uh -huh. Polish army. And the Polish eagle has a crown on it. The communists took off the crown when they took over Poland, mm -hmm. but kept the eagle. But now the eagle is back uh, uh -huh. on the Polish uh, symbol. And this is your helmet? This is my helmet. I was able to bring it. I brought it a case of, empty case of ammunition <laughs> because I carried my clothes in it. <laughs> that was convenient. Okay, you can put that and, down now. <laughs> and I brought the helmet uh -huh. and, and I have still the insignia from my That's the uniform. Next day. Mm -hmm. This is the insignia of the British 8th Army. Mm -hmm. This is the insignia of the Polish Second mm -hmm. Corps. This is the statue which is in Vistula River in Warsaw of a siren. It's called Siren. And this is a bison. Poland is the only country in Europe that has bisons. And this was a symbol of the Fifth Division. Now, Julian, uh, have you had a chance to have any reunions with any of your former army mates? Well, I had been in close touch with um, my roommates from the army in uh, Torino, Italy, who was actually in Siberia. And, but unfortunately he has passed away. Mm -hmm. He was, it turned out he also worked at RCA in the research division in Princeton. And I, we reconnected totally by chance when I went to visit the RCA in Princeton. Mm -hmm. And then I reconnected with another friend who was my roommate from the Polish army in London and he went to Canada and from Canada came to Boston and he had worked at Raytheon and he was in Boston. We reconnected mm -hmm. but he also passed away mm -hmm. and we were all very good friends. Mm -hmm. Julian, we are, of course, in the Museum of World War II Boston. Would you care to say a few words about the museum? Well, the museum is a fantastic place. It has so many memorabilia and so much, so many real artifacts, and I am a great admirer of this museum. Well, I think we'll end it right here. Julian Busking, thank you so much for coming in and interviewing for the Natick Veterans Oral History Project and the Museum of World War II Boston. Thank you. Mm -hmm.